God is not who you think he is. God is not who you think he is. He's better than you've ever imagined. Picture with me the scene that we've just read. John has an encounter with Jesus, and and as he did, he fell on his face as if a dead man, so overwhelmed by what he'd experienced. And then he hears a voice calling to him, come up here. And he comes up into the throne room of heaven. And there before him is one who is radiating the light and glory of the kingdom. And around this one are rumblings of thunder and flashes of light. And in this immense radiation of power that is coming from the throne in a way that is so surprising, before the throne is a sea of glass. Perfect peace amongst this radiant, majestic power. And then around the throne are four living creatures, so strange, so wild, eyes everywhere, seeing everything. And they, they circle the throne continuously, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And around the throne, around them are 24 thrones with elders. And as these living creatures surround the throne and, thro- uh, uh, surround the throne and worship the Lord, these 24 four elders stand up and fall on their faces before the living God and throw their crowns down. Those things that they have worked for and been rewarded for. And they say, these are as nothing before you. And they fall on their face and worship the living God. A rainbow of emerald radiating every kind of light, a voice like the sound of many waters. The holiness of God, the majesty of God, the glory of God. Every person in history who's encountered encountered the holiness of God has either fallen on their face as a dead man like John did, or like, like Ezekiel just was overwhelmed and again just fell down, or perhaps like Daniel, who it says his thoughts became crazy and confused. And it says, and he changed color. All those tanning treatments and whitening, whitening treatments, totally unnecessary. But everyone who's encountered the holiness of God is overwhelmed by it, is transformed by it, is made new by it. Isaiah is standing before the throne of God and the throne, God's train just entering the temple, cries out, woe is me, woe is me. I am undone for I am a man of unclean lips. You see, the holiness of God does something to us. It does something to people as they enter into the presence of God. And every time those four living creatures go around the throne, imagine eyes everywhere. They see everything. They know everything in so much more detail than you or I could ever do. For eternity, they have seen everything that God has done and everything that God has said. And yet, every time they go around the throne again, they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You see, every time they circle the throne, they see a new aspect of God. And once again, they are thrown into raptures of worship. God is not who you think he is. He's so much more. You see, the holiness of God is God's perfections. The holiness of God is God's perfections. It's his magnificent excellence. His all-encompassing power. 
that rumbles like thunder from his throne. It's his righteous judgments that when they are spoken, they fall like a knife, like a double-edged sword into one's soul, and they divide between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. They are his wraparound love that enfolds you in goodness. And his holiness is his supreme perfection, his absolute purity. Nothing but God in God. Absolutely pure, righteous, good, Loving, kind, nothing but goodness, nothing but righteousness, power that is pure, authority that is right. God. And when we when we glance at it, we're transformed. And every time we see it, we are changed. You see, God is not who you think he is. He's so much better than, that. better than that. Any view that you have of God falls short of his holiness. Falls short of his holiness. If you haven't worked out today, we're talking about the holiness of God. And my hope was that as we read that scripture, you would encounter God. I, I'm more interested in you encountering the holiness of God than hearing about the holiness of God today. I want you to come face to face with the complete otherness of God. A God who is not like anything you've ever experienced in this earth. And so every time you go into his presence, you must relearn. You must re-understand. You must come to know truth in a new way. Every time you go into his presence, you must be prepared to change. There is not a day that goes by that I don't pray this prayer. God, change me. God, change me. You know, we think that our problems stem from all those, those really grumpy people around us, from all those people who don't understand, from that husband or that wife that doesn't get you, from that job that just doesn't work for you. But the truth is all our problems stem from an internal misunderstanding of who God is. And when we go into his presence, we find his holiness and his holiness comes like I said, like that two-edged sword, like, like pure light that penetrates every fiber of your being and sets things right. And sets things right. Sometime back, quite a while back, Andrew and I were at a safari lodge. And at the safari lodge, they had an enclosure where they kept some lions. And these lions... They fed chunks of meat that they would winch out on this winch. No one went in there. And these lions were man killers. They had been rescued from farms where they had killed people. And when they, when they winched out this meat, they allowed you to sit behind a wall where there were slots that you could actually view these lions eating. So while we were there, these two lions came up and they both went for the meat. And obviously only one can eat at a time. And so, so they locked shoulders and they started to wrestle for this meat. The, the growls and the rumblings and the roars that were there. And at the same time, you saw these two majestic beasts shoulder to shoulder, muscles rippling down their backs. It was like a display of raw power. And all I could think is, praise God for this wall. Another time, myself and some friends, we were on an adventure race. 
And in the middle of Swaziland, after like 24 hours of running and cycling, we were muddy, we were tired, we were exhausted, we were just a slightly grumpy, very hungry. We turned this corner in the, in the path and we came upon this waterfall. You could not get to this waterfall except by foot. And believe you me, we had used our feet. And coming down was this pure water, no, no debris. It had come out directly out of the mountains, absolutely crystal clear. And in that area, they have this kind of rock that's kind of a creamy yellow color. And it, it, coming down the mountain, this, this rock was lying in slabs, like these cream cake-colored slabs of solid granite, piled one on top of each other. And this turquoise water was flowing over these yellow rocks. And, you know, as I stood there, every bit of tiredness faded. All my hunger pangs went away, and all I could think was, oh, my word. God is good. The majesty of that sight, the sound of the rushing waters, the beauty of the turquoise over the yellow, the, the power displayed, but the beauty manifested was just magnificent. Another time I was on a hike with some other friends, a much more laid back hike but still majestic and lovely. And we were coming, we'd come up the mountain and we were, we were walking along the top of the mountain. And in this area, there was a breeding ground for some raptors, some birds of prey. And as we, it was the early morning and the thermals were just rising and we were at the top of the hill. And when we looked to our right, these, these vultures had launched off the mountain and were riding the thermals. But because we were so high up, they were actually at our eye level. And there were these many uh, vultures just circling, uh, two meter wingspans, just like I felt like I could reach out and touch them. Some of you have had babies, some of you have not. But maybe you've been in the room When a baby was born, it's like when you're in the room, it's like there's a moment when all the air is just sucked out of the room and then the baby takes a breath and usually screams. But at that moment, it's like you, you feel the angels bow. You feel the holiness of God into the room. You feel his presence as a new life is born. Why do these kinds of things thrill us? They thrill us because deep in our heart, there is a yearning for God's holiness. And God has placed, stamped into creation, his beauty, his majesty, his power, his righteous judgments, his love. His perfection. He stamped moments of those. And when we see them, they are like signposts that point our heart to the ultimate reality of the glory and the holiness of God. And our heart looks at those things and we yearn. We yearn for more than the mundane, everyday grind of humanity. And we say, there's more. And every one of those things are meant to call us up like John. They are an open door that with a voice crying out, come up here, come and observe the glory of God. You know, an interesting thing about God's holiness and, and knowing more of God and his glory is that you can't just choose to know more of God. Did you know that? You can only know more of God when he chooses to reveal more of himself to you, when he opens the door of your mind, when he opens your understanding. And the point is, when that moment happens, you must walk through the door. You must step into the revelation. You must take use of the moment and you must watch. As John did, you must see the holiness of God. You must watch how his majesty unfolds. 
And of course, we can, we can make room for that by setting aside in our a time in our day to observe God, think of God, read his word, allow his truth to settle in our hearts, to observe the open door and go through it. You know, God is so large, so massive, so enormous that he fills every minute square millimeter of creation and beyond. There is no place where God is not. So the only time that we can leave God's presence is if God clears the space. If God acknowledges our desire to be away from him and he moves away from us. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden Eden, when mankind said we want to be the masters of our own destiny, that we want to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. God, the Bible says, he put them out of the garden, but in essence what he did is he moved away. The breath of life that he breathed into him, he just breathed back. He said, I value your free will so much that I'll give you your desire. And he breathed out. You see, sin is not so much what you do in, con- in contrast to God. Sin is actually a vacuum of God's presence. Sin is a corrosive force. A corrosive force that eats away at your soul. It's a giant nothingness that sucks away hope, that sucks away life, and slowly but surely reels in your thoughts, distorts your thinking, captivates and misplaces your affections. It's insidious grotesque nothingness that desires to eat you alive. It sits in a golden goblet like poison speaking of the excellencies of independence, of self-will, of self-preservation. The thing about sin is it has no power until you drink it. It has no power until you drink it. Sadly, we've all drank it. You see, the thing about the holiness of God is that God is always fully God, and so, as we've spoken about before, and so, for, for that nothingness to come into God's presence, it, must, it will instantly be destroyed by His holiness, His presence, His life, His goodness. And so, mankind, with, with, with these empty places of nothingness, corrosive force of deadly sin in our hearts, when we go into God's presence... Because sin is in us, we are destroyed. So what does God do with his holiness? How does he bring you in? There is only one way. He wraps you in the love of Christ. Hides you under Jesus' cloak. And Jesus walks into God's presence with you. God walks into God's presence with you. And then while you, while you are sitting in God's presence, he allows the holiness of God to begin to infiltrate and fill those places of emptiness. Have you ever grazed your knee 
and you went and put a piece of cotton wool with, with dental on it and swabbed your knee to stop infection? You've ever done that? Do you remember the sting? Do you remember the pain as healing happens? You know, bringing our sinful nature, na- natures into God's presence is just like that. As His holiness begins to invade our emptiness, those, those raw places, those, those distortions, those pieces, places of pain and brokenness, those misunderstandings, they like raw wounds that His holiness begins to stamp itself upon. And we feel the pain, but the pain is so good, and the pain means I'm becoming whole. I'm becoming whole. To pursue God's holiness is to pursue wholeness. To pursue God's holiness is to pursue wholeness. You know, I was once at a campus meeting at the University of Witz, and someone asked me, what does holiness feel like? And I said, holiness feels like this to me. It feels like taking hold of a high voltage wire that's live and hanging on to it. And the power from that wire is coursing through my body and it's painful and it feels like it's killing me, but yet I hang on. And I hang on, and I hang on, and as that power curses, not curses, courses through me, it's destroying every evil thing, it's setting things right, it's making things new, and I just keep hanging on so that you, until there comes a moment where there's nothing left but me and the power of God. This is what the holiness of God feels like. Painful to our sinful nature, but so life-giving. If we want to talk about resurrection life that the band was singing so beautifully earlier, is resurrection life happens when we abandon ourselves to the holiness of God and we allow His power to do its work and to resurrect us into something new by the power of the Spirit. It's when we go into His presence and we allow Him to bring into the light everything, to to push the cockroaches out from their hiding places, to make a way where, where He is seen in every part of us. And then we stand up. We stand up in the power of God. And it's us and Jesus. And all the pain's gone. And all the distortions are set right. And we see things as they really are. And we understand as they truly exist. You know... Shortly after I got saved, I was introduced to spending time in God's presence and allowing the Spirit of God to minister to me and and fill me again. And I want to be honest with you, for the first four years at least, every time I went into God's presence like that, I simply sobbed. I cried. It was like it was like all the dark cupboards were flung open and God's light was invading places that hadn't seen light for ages and my eyes were like trying to adjust and my heart was trying to adjust and for 4 years I wept every time I went into God's presence. And then one day I didn't weep. One day I laughed. One day I went into God's presence and joy erupted like a fountain because I realized how saved I was, how redeemed I was, how loved I was. And now I saw God not through the brokenness of my past, but but through the glory of his future for me and everything looked different. And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I'm laughing still. God's holiness in us makes us into signposts pointing to his love. Israel, have you ever read that Old Testament? 
If you haven't, please do. It's so good. But it's also terrifying. I mean, those laws and those things that they had to conform to and the things that they had to do and how they had to sacrifice. And I mean, it's like God had them under their thumb. It was so much stuff. Have you ever wondered about that? I've wondered about it all the time. I feel like all I have to do is accept Jesus. And they had to do these three or these 613 things. But you see, God was seeing past Israel to you and me. And he needed a nation that would carry his holiness. He needed a nation that would be a signpost to the nations around him of his love, his goodness, his righteousness, his truth, his holiness. He needed a holy nation, a nation set apart from the other nations that would be completely different from the nations as God is completely different from our existence. And he needed such a nation to stand up and be seen so that these other nations would come streaming and say, this God who has made you so different, this is the God I want. But time after time after time, Israel refused and they followed the ways of the other nations. And God had to reset them over and over and over again until finally they got it and he could bring Jesus. And as he brought Jesus into that, that nation that had embraced his holiness. Jesus then began to call the nations. And they came streaming. In the first 200 years after his resurrection, every nation that you could get to by a road was in the kingdom. And we're... By the next thousand years, approximately every nation on the earth had some witness of God's holiness in the form of people who carried the light of Christ in them. You see, like, like Israel was meant to embody God's holiness. So as we come to Christ he fills us and we begin to embody his holiness. And we walk out into the world, not self-righteous, but holy. Yeah. Not boasting about how fantastic we are and looking down at other people, but radiating the love and the life and the truth and the purity of God. Right. And as we stand in those dark places, the holiness of God calls out like a signpost to those people, come this way, come this way. It's like an open door that John experienced in that moment in Revelation 4 saying to the people around us, come up here. And as we speak and we live and we do the things that he has said, the people come walking into God's kingdom to embrace the truth of who he is. They find Jesus and they are hidden, wrapped in his love, hidden under his cloak. And he smuggles them into the presence of God and allows the presence of God to begin to do its work of transformation. God is not who you think he is. God is better than you think. Always. There will never be a moment like those four living creatures that the holiness of God is not available to you to show you something new, to show you something more. The depths of his brilliance, the infinity of his perfections means that not a day goes by that you are not invited to learn more of who he is, to be enthralled by more of who he is, to circle that throne and cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What I love about that scripture is as those four living creatures are doing that thing, do you notice what the 24 elders do? 
They fall down before God and they throw their crowns on the ground. In essence, when those four living creatures encounter God's holiness, it acts like a signpost to those elders and calls them into worship. And they respond to the revelation of God's holiness that these creatures are speaking of. And they cry out, yes, you are worthy of all honor, glory, power, strength. And we throw all our achievements at your feet as worth nothing in comparison to the enormous achievement you have done in my life. God is not who you think he is. God is better than you think. God is holy. God is holy. Andrew and I were talking yesterday. And this came up in our conversation. You know, we don't come through Christ and simply add God as some kind of genie helper where we hand him our agenda and our ways and we say, God, could you please help me fulfill this? When we come to God, we come and we say, God, give me your agenda that I can partner with you and that we, that I can be filled with your holiness and together we can be successful. 